maybe before you get uh, turn around, maybe Samantha Dunn, who who is <laughs> responsible for not just this project, but really being the assistant director of community works means she's also been in charge of the Moran Frame. She's been leading her efforts on Memorial. Can you just sort of summarize for people what's happened on this site up and up until now before the pallets arrived? Sure. So we've been getting the site ready. We got um, city council approval to. Use, you next I'm, I'm going to stand next to you so you have the <laughs> mics. Um, city Council approval to use this site in March um, went through the conditional use uh, permitting process um, through the city of Burlington and has started site work in August. Um, so working with local site contractors while well, the majority of what's happening on the site is on top of the site. It's a temporary project meant to be here for three years. It's going to be able to be reutilized in a different location. Um, we did make water wastewater connections and do electrical trenching to make sure everything is underground providing services to the shelters. On this site, there'll be 30 shelters, 25 of them you see here from Pallet Shelter. There's five additional shelters coming from a local manufacturer called Up and This, and they will be here um, next by the end of next month. And then the two additional buildings are coming from KBS Builders, and they will provide um, six full bathrooms with showers, facilities, and then a community space to serve residents on site with offices, service provisions, kitchen, laundry, things like that. And those buildings will arrive next month as well. Great. And then, um, Ben, maybe you can describe these. Um, there's, you guys just got here yesterday, right? <laughs> yep, we did get here yesterday. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we are a pallet. We are a, we are a public benefit company that um, provides employment opportunities to people with lived experience in homelessness. Um, so we have dual missions, one of which is that employment piece, and then the second of which is to end unsheltered homelessness across the United States. So we specialize in rapid and dignified shelter deployments, not only with these 64 square foot units that you can see here, but also larger 100 square foot units, bathrooms, showers, laundry, and community structures. Um, as mentioned, we showed up yesterday morning, started building at around 10 a.m., and we're probably two hours or so from getting these 25 shelters um, fully built. And um, once they're hooked up to power and anchored, they'll be ready for folks to move in. Um, and they arrived kind of flat on these, uh, they on these crates? Yep, as you can see, they arrived on these custom-made shipping pallets. They ship upright. Uh, we can fit about 15 of these structures on a semi-truck. Um, this is actually a very exciting deployment for us because they are um, the first uh, highly insulated units that we're shipping out. So they have an R value of 7.5, um, which means they will be staying really nice and toasty all throughout Vermont winters, which is obviously very important for, for our residents. Great. Um, so yeah. Why don't we go um, take a tour of one of these and then like Samantha said we'll come back and maybe say a little bit more about the work that still needs to happen and uh, some, some of the plans going forward. But let's just go check yeah. out. These are pretty unique structures and give people a chance to take a look at them. Yeah, sounds good. So, so talk about, so let's start with the bases. Each, each, uh, each, yeah. each structure has a customized base here? Exactly. So there's a, a couple of basic infrastructure requirements for these shelters, one of which is relatively flat ground, and then the shelters themselves should be shimmed to level. So um, your wonderful general contractor here in Burlington constructed these um, two by four frames um, to get this ground completely level. So we can come in, place the base, and then build the unit on top of it. Um, in addition to that requirement, we need an electrical connection to each unit to power the heater, the hardwired CO smoke detector, the lights, um, and then they'll also be anchored so they can meet your wind requirements here in Burlington. And did you say, Samantha, the power is actually underground to each the unit? Power is underground stub to each yep. site. Yep. Uh, that's great. Yep. Um, so you got the outsides all set up yesterday? Yep. With including the roofs kind of get... Exactly. So we have seven panels in total. We have a floor, four, four walls, and then two roof panels. So yesterday we threw up all those panels and bolted those together. And then today we've been going inside, installing the smoke detectors, installing the bunks, installing the electrical kits, the fire extinguishers, um, making sure everything's working properly. Um, so kind of a little bit more broadly about these structures, they are very unique in that they're made of all inorganic material. So they're mold, mildew, rot resistant. Unlike what you might see in a wooden structure, you could actually power wash this entire unit. You can bleach it. It's very, very easy to clean. And as the city of Burlington is planning on doing, it's also easy to paint. So right now they're all white, but apparently in a couple of weeks there's going to be some some fun paint included on these units. Um, which yeah, we'll come back and talk. We'll talk a little, little bit more about that with Samantha in a sec. Why don't we uh, 
You want to kind of lead people through what's in each unit? Yeah, without a doubt. I don't know if people want to kind of... Squeeze in here. It's a little dark. We don't have power yet, so we don't have the light on. Um, but starting out with basic safety features associated with the shelter, hardwired CO smoke detector is incredibly important at the top there. Um, we have an emergency egress exit here in the bottom of the unit, and there's a wall-mounted fire extinguisher also in the bottom of the unit. Um, each shelter does have a locking door with two keys and a master key that the site manager will have. Um, and of course, a bunk and a mattress is so important when we're providing someone with a dignified shelter space. Um, openable, lockable windows, also very important for ventilation and for light and just quality of life. Um, and as mentioned, each one of these takes about 45 minutes to an hour to build. So we'll build these 25 over two days. And I think he said this once already, but this it's, it's heated and cooled yep. by a heat pump unit. So it, uh, this unit only has heat. This is okay. a 4,500 watt heater. We do have the option for air conditioning that would go at the top there that can okay. be installed after the fact. Um, okay. Because of the color of these structures, it doesn't really heat up like you would in a tent or a car. So it pretty much feels like you're in the shade in the outdoors. So if folks need AC, that can be added on a later, at a later date. Great. And uh, maybe with Samantha, we can go over the one we talk about now, the, the, this heating, it's, it's electric heat. This is electric heat. Yep. Um, the whole site is electric. There's no fossil fuels on the site. So this will um, get electricity from Burlington Electric Department. Um, they've been working with us to make the uh, efficiency upgrades and the, the larger buildings that are coming on site will have um, solar on them and that will contribute to the energy, you know, off taking the energy load of the whole site. Between BED and I think some state incentive programs, we've been able to yes. secure some essentially net zero funding to net make this work. Net zero funding, um, f certainly for the community buildings and really those will produce more uh, energy than they consume and so th some of that energy will sort of come towards the bill of these buildings. Now, these also can be taken down and reused, right? And yep, we can take this down in about half an hour, 45 minutes, or you can pick it up with a forklift and put it on a flatbed truck and just move it across town without even taking it apart. Right, and they can be packed flat and stored for you know another emergency deployment or relocated. Yep. And are we going to need to bring you back from Seattle to do that, or is this something with a little bit of training people can A little can bit of training, people can definitely do it. Yeah. Um, so we would Great. likely send out one pallet rep to kind of lead that, to lead that process and provide some training, but it's very doable. And so we've got 25 of these yes. that are now here, and almost all, all this interior is almost set up on in a couple more hours, you're saying, and yep. we'll, we'll be done. And then there are another five, two-unit uh, nope, no, just okay. a single unit. So okay. five of these can become um, two bed units. I see. Okay. I don't know if we have one set up, but it's just another one of these bunks goes on the goes on the other wall, and we have, we specifically ordered materials to have five of those in case there were two people that who wanted to be sheltered together okay. in this small space. We are not anticipating just putting people who um, are not already wanting to be partnered in a unit together. So primarily serving single adults. Do you want to say a little more, Smith, about how the site has been set up and the, the kind of strategy around it? Sure. Um, we have been um, working closely with Duncan Vesneski Architecture um, and the civil engineer and our site contractor to figure out how to make this site, which is a you know was a parking lot, work with minimal um, interruptions. So we are using the existing stormwater system on site, which means that the parking lot is not level. Um, second gen builders custom built each of these platforms to make sure the shelter is level and that the water will continue to move through the site. Um, the site has been set up in these sort of clustered neighborhoods where you see the doors <coughs> facing each other slightly offset um, to create smaller spaces. Um, we'll get to adding the color to that where people will walk through the site. Um, there's an emergency um, access lane for emergency vehicles that travels through the site that's 15 feet wide. And then the rest of sort of the open space will allow for sort of community gathering space with some garden beds, some shade structures for folks to be able to gather outside. Great. A anything else about the units while you're here, Ben, you, you want to point out or that people should know about? Um, I, think that's, I think that's pretty much it and that okay. covers us, yeah. All right, great. Um, I do want to introduce a couple other members of the team, the city team that have been really uh, instrumental in making this, this project, getting this project to this point. Here's Brian Pine, our director from, from CETO, who uh, has really helped usher this through from the time when we first announced this uh, last December um, until now. 
Uh, and we have Sarah Russell, who is our special assistant to end homelessness, who um, is here with us today. And, and uh, I, I think whenever we talk about this project, it's important to, to understand this is one strategy that is part of a, a larger effort to end homelessness, as that title suggests. And we'll talk about how this factors into that. Um, uh, welcome City Councilor Joe McGee here. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Marcella Genje as well, who um, has been dedicated to our homelessness efforts for, for years as well. And hello, David. David is a neighbor who has been one of the uh, most uh, vocal uh, supporters of this project as well. Thanks for, for being here, David. Um, so it, thank you all for coming out and, and being part of this very, this is the first time I've gotten to see him. I've been driving by whenever I can for, uh, since construction began, but it's the first time I've seen them uh, all assembled. Uh, it was fun to, I appreciate the chance to do that with all of you. This is a important uh, positive day on, on the journey towards getting this project. Uh, open. Um, it's uh, it's not the end uh, of the line yet. Why don't you speak a little bit, Samantha, about uh, what happens from here? I know you touched sure, on it before, I but just a little bit. Yep, yeah, we've got so um, five more additional shelters coming, and then these two common buildings that are requ really required to be able to open the site will be coming in November. Um, there is power underground that needs to be pulled up and, and connected to the shelters. Um, we've got some important community building uh, days coming up the, over the next two weekends. We'll be inviting community members onto the site uh, to help implement kind of a site-wide mural um, that's been envisioned with some partners and really excited to do that and build some garden beds. So um, again, we're hoping that the, the construction of the site is done uh, before Thanksgiving. And I know Champlain Housing Trust is working hard to hire the staff that will be required to be able to open before December 1st. I want to just make sure everyone caught that. The, you know, I, I hear right right now from Burlingtonians almost every time I'm at the at a public coffee like I was this morning or talking to various groups about the challenges we're facing right now. Everyone always wants to know what can they do to help. And this project really offers an opportunity over the next two weekends. There will be these community volunteer efforts that will involve painting, the creation of these garden beds. And CEDAW has already been sending out some communications on this. There'll be an email going out to about 8,000 folks from the mayor's office shortly as well. If people don't get one of those emails, what do they do to, uh, how do they best find out information to sign up? CEDAW FD at City of Burlington. No, BurlingtonBT.org. Yeah, it's on the sign as well. Okay, so, so that's an email address. Yeah. Okay. Um, the so and again uh, the goal is to have this facility open and operating in November um, we have uh, as, as there has been some public discussion of we've been finalizing uh, the contract with Champlain Housing Trust and finalizing all the details and they are actively hiring and working towards that goal um, I I often get the question I think it's important to kind of share while we're standing here uh, you know, how is this going to address uh, the issue of homelessness when we know that there are, uh, by the best counts, we have a couple hundred people who are, are chronically homeless right now. And what I think the answer to that is, is that this is one piece of a comprehensive strategy to end homelessness that the city is currently pursuing with numerous partners. At the same time we announced this effort last December, we also announced the creation of this position, Sarah's position, the assistant director to end homelessness. We also announced the investment in new uh, a strengthening of our coordinated entry system, um, which is the a countywide system for uh, using data to and information to help all the organizations that are working on homelessness in one way or another have shared information and be coordinating with each other and finding the uh, best housing solutions for every individual who is facing homelessness. This is going to be a key facility uh, for us in that strategy in that this, this allows us, everyone living here will be working with housing navigators, working with uh, several, and, and maybe Sarah, you'd like to speak to it, uh, uh, or Brian, a number of nonprofit partners who are providing different services and uh, ensuring in a focused, centralized way that we're doing everything, can, everything we can to help people get into permanent housing, find jobs, get into 
uh, <clears throat> drug and mental health treatment programs if that's appropriate for them. Um, we've never had a facility quite like this where we, we uh, could reach so many people at the same time. Do you want to add anything to that, Brian? Sarah, why don't you help here? Now, on the service side, I think it's important to recognize that we have a number of organizations <coughs> providing services. We don't want this to be like um, uh, barriers to getting services, so we want to make sure that people get services from who they're comfortable receiving them from, and Sarah can talk more about who are the service providers. Sure, so we'll be providing yeah. on-site yeah. Yeah, nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll be providing some on-site uh, case management services from uh, CBOEO. There'll be um, one and a half full-time positions here who will be uh, working with people, guests who are staying um, to determine what barriers we may have to helping them to enter housing, um, working on those barriers and um, moving forward toward um, mental health supports, medical supports, and any kind of substance, uh, substance use um, challenges they may have as well. Um, we also have agreements with uh, CHCB. We'll be providing on-site uh, medical and mental health uh, services here in addition to CVOEO's CORA outreach team. Uh, they'll be providing uh, meals and uh, basic needs, basic necessities for people, as well as connection to resources. Um, and uh, finally, we're working on other uh, partnerships uh, with other folks to bring services to the site so that people can access services here. I think that's something about the site design, uh, Moreau, that I didn't mention, that the, the community building that um, will be at the front of the site, every, anyone that comes onto the site will need to pass through that building, will be interacting with staff, um, and have access to all those services right here. They won't be required to take a bus, to walk, to get a ride, to access those services. And we have heard from other municipalities across the country when researching how to do this, that that has really had an impact on some of their hardest to reach folks, that being able, it's some people, it might take them a month um, to be comfortable talking to people, but once they're here and they're comfortable and it feels safe, they're then able to engage in those um, services that are available right here that you know they're not able to access otherwise. I think one last sort of piece of context, I'm happy to take some questions that is important, I think, for understanding this project and how it fits into our larger strategy. Uh, we are, we have created this facility at a time when the housing issues the state is facing, Chittenden County is facing, are particularly acute. For a whole variety of reasons, we saw housing production slow down during COVID. We saw uh, increase for homes throughout the sort of full spectrum of housing types increase during COVID with, you know, in part because of how successful Vermont was it, and appealing Vermont was during the pandemic is one of the places that, uh, that weathered that storm uh, better than just where, about anywhere else. Uh, we, uh, so these, these, the pressures being, we're facing right now, you know, you add to that the sort of economic uncertainty and volatility of the moment, there are really historic acute housing pressures right now. We are on a longer term basis attempting to build our way and work our way out of this. There's about 400 homes in Burlington that have either recently been completed or uh, will be are un in construction right now. There are hundreds more that are uh, in fairly advanced stages of design and planning and on their way towards construction. And we, we are working towards really some very structural changes to the way Burlington zoning laws change that will create uh, thousands of additional housing uh, opportunities um, in, in the years ahead. And you know, we are meeting a day after the Planning Commission just took a significant step with, those, with two of those zoning efforts and uh, warned for public hearing both the South End rezoning as well as the Trinity Campus rezoning. That happened last night at the, the Planning Commission, which means those uh, initiatives are on their way to the City Council and should be in front of the City Council sometime around the end of the year. So uh, that's you know, that's, I think, the larger answer as to uh, how we're going to end homelessness and hopefully give some sense of how this facility, which is in, not, not only is this intended to be temporary housing for individuals, this is intended to be a temporary facility that will be here for approximately three years. Um, we heard from Ben how these, uh, these homes can be uh, moved and reused elsewhere. Um, and we are already in discussions with Champlain Housing Trust 
uh, and starting the sort of stakeholder discussions about what would happen after three years to the site. Uh, from my sense, this should remain um, permanently part of the housing solution in Burlington, but we're just at the beginning of the conversation what that looks like. So with that, um, happy to answer any other questions that people have. Do you have any idea yet what the eligibility will be like, you know, who will be able to apply, how people will be able to apply? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, working with CHT as the operating partner to determine policies and procedures. Um, we haven't quite honed in on exactly um, how that will be determined. However, we have been consulting heavily with the outreach teams um, who work within Chittenden County to be able to begin to identify folks who might be a good fit for the shelter. Are you taking applications yet? No, there's no applications at this time. Like I said, we're still working through the policies and procedures. Um, and if someone is is currently without housing and interested in obtaining shelter, they should be reaching out to 211, which is the current resource. Um, and as we move closer um, to opening here, um, people should begin to connect with outreach workers from the Burlington Police Department, from the Howard Center, or from CBOEO or Safe Harbor Clinic if they're interested in accessing shelter um, at this location. Have you gotten a sense as to how many people are interested? Um, I don't. I don't have a sense of how many people are interested. But what I can say is, from our most recent um, data, indicates that there are about 70 people who are unsheltered outside um, in the city of Burlington. About 10 to 15 additional folks beyond city limits um, in other towns within Chittenden County. Um, so while there are, you know, 30 to 35 folks who could be helped at this location, um, we're we're still not able to fully meet the need of our unsheltered population in Burlington. So what about the, un, the older unhoused people who are in the 60s and 50s or 70s? Uh, are they going to consider first? Um, we have, not, like I said, we're still working on screening um, and developing those policies with the operating partner CHT. Um, we have had some conversations with AgeWell um, in Chittenden County, and they, if there are um, people who fall within their um, within their service range in terms of older folks um, or people who have disabilities, they will actually come on site to provide um, age-specific case management for that population. Why is it a temporary uh, pod community? Why only three years? <clears throat> so, let me answer a couple questions with that. One, you didn't quite ask, but you know, first of all, it's important that this is an emergency shelter. Uh, the, the rules of it being an emergency shelter uh, will be in place. The, the, uh, it is, um, uh, I think, important if this is going to play a significant role in reducing that uh, number of people that are unsheltered living outside, um, if this is you know, really going to help us uh, move people towards permanent housing, I think it's important that it, it, it keeps that status and is this resource that our, the social workers that are working with individuals who are living outside um, are, are coordinating with, it, that, that's what this is, it's an emergency shelter. Um, I, you know, Pat, um, it is certainly my hope and belief that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't need this facility three, three years from now. You know, before the pandemic, we had about 35 chronically, it, it varied a little bit, but at one point, our lowest point, we had about 35 chronically homeless individuals. We had a much lower population of people who were un, you know, unsheltered and living outside. We've got to work our way back to that and beyond. We want to end homelessness. And when we achieve that, we won't um, need exactly this facility anymore. We may need something. I'm not saying our need for some level of temporary shelter is going to go away entirely, uh, but uh, I, I think this is a moment where things are particularly challenging and this is a, an emergency facility set up for, for this moment and we got to work ourselves to a better place. What about substance use at the facility? Has there been any decision about Yeah, that's very, that's very clear that this is, uh, there are some details that are being still worked out about screening, but this has always been planned as a, uh, low barrier shelter, meaning that it is one that people uh, will not be um, uh, prohibited from if they are still actively actively using. Um, it is specifically, again, this is a facility that we hope is a more appealing option uh, for some of the people who are 
currently live, you know, living in some of these public lands. Um, we want to create uh, a more flexible, more um, uh, appealing uh, type of uh, emergency shelter than um, some of the other options that people have had available. So it's, it's definitely going to be a low barrier facility um, that has a particular focus on trying to bring down the number of people who are unsheltered and, and, living, and sleeping outside. And I think what we know about substance use is that when we, when we provide safe places for people to be and places for people to sleep, then they are more willing to build trust in the system that they haven't always trusted. So we'll have on-site um, recovery groups from the Turning Point, of, um, Turning Point Center of Chittenden County um, in addition to um, po potentially um, working with the Vermont Criminal Justice Reform uh, Group around some of their um, overdose education and prevention efforts as well that will also be available on-site. Um, so I think one of the things I'll throw in is that while you all, you know, we're walking around and looking at these shelters and while we're thinking about the people who are unsheltered, you know, outside, these have doors with locks on them and the level of safety and security and respect that, uh, that, that people will have here is much greater than in other places and we're hoping they can really use that safe place as a platform to access additional services as well. So it's a really good point about uh, that. I just want to amplify what Sarah's saying about uh, we, we are, you know, Chittenden County was doing pretty well in 2018 and 2019, relatively speaking, with respect to the opioid crisis. We were seeing our overdose death numbers had come down by 50%. They stayed at that lower level in 2019. Some of the other metrics we were tracking were going in the right direction. At the time, it seemed like this hub and spoke system that the state of Vermont had set up and that we had sort of added to here in Chittenden County, we started calling it a hub spoke and node system, was really getting, was really getting many people into uh, opioid treatment, medically assisted treatment, and we were seeing good outcomes for large numbers of people. It's really quite heartbreakingly clear that we've had a real setback on that front uh, during the pandemic and that's what's followed. I think some of that is the pandemic. Some of that is also the change in the kind of dominant drugs that are being used right now, being fentanyl and, and meth. And, and meth. Um, the, uh, one of the things we, we continue to convene dozens of stakeholders every month in a meeting that I lead called the community staff meeting. And one of the things that has become clear over the last year there is it is harder because in large part because of fentanyl and the way the body reacts to fentanyl is harder to get people into treatment and it's easier for people to fall out of treatment if they are fentanyl users. Um, this working with people, getting them uh, it, um, onto a steady regime of taking medicines uh, is more labor intensive. It takes different strategies. I'm quite hopeful that working with people in this setting, I, I think it's very likely that a significant number of the people living here will uh, have opioid use disorders, that we will be able to work with them in a new way and, 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 uh, and, and help them move to a better place in a, in a different way. So. Uh, I see this facility as, uh, in a sense, addressing not just the homelessness crisis, but also this related but separate uh, crisis that we have with uh, uh, illicit drug use. There's, there's a few, well, a couple of yeah. things that come to mind, but one in terms of opening, you're thinking late November, early December. It sounds like some of that's contingent on CHT hiring positions. Um, is, Do you want to speak to, just sort of, yeah. Are, is there concern that, like, you know, I know labor's force is an issue right now that there might not be the workforce to open on time. It seems like you're building everything relatively quickly. We're, we're building and I know Champlain Housing Trust is is working hard to hire the people required. Um, I think there has been a slight um, softening in the labor market, which was one of the reasons that Champlain Housing Trust sort of agreed um, to enter into a contract with the city of Burlington. That was one of their major concerns and kind of why, why it took so long um, for us to get here in these discussions. So. I think we're feeling confident um, that CHG is working hard. I think all of us are we're working together um, to staff up the facility to get it open. And on a point of, I know you don't have the eligibility or figuring out who's going to be in, but is it permanent in, it's not like the motel program where it's like a 90 day stay, or these are gonna be relatively like, if you're here, you're here for, We'll follow the zoning regulations for emergency um, shelter, which is a 60-day 
um, stay with the opportunity six, six, six months. months with the opportunity to extend hundred an additional 180 days. Um, so we'll be working within those zoning regulations. But yes, it's a it's a much longer program and not a need to reapply every month and things like that. Okay, okay. Mayor, I was curious who you guys looked at as whether locally in Vermont or nationally across anywhere in the country that you guys took as a frame of reference for a project like this, where you guys took inspiration from? We did, um, and this is a team that did a lot of the, the, the heavy lifting on this, but this is, um, uh, as we heard from Ben earlier, where there's something like a, a hundred of these, uh, approaching a hundred of these communities that um, have been set up in cities around the country. As we were considering this strategy, uh, the CETO team looked at, at um, many of these examples that you know, might be a little bit ahead of us, and we did take uh, confidence from the way in which those were operating that this was, uh, this was a good idea, that this was something we could get done and that would have a, have a positive impact. Um, I, I'm you know, encouraged to hear from, uh, from Ben uh, that this is, you know, I, I think when we have this installation complete and set up, um, I think it will compare well to any comparable installation uh, in, in the country. I appreciate the uh, focus on design, on details that make this really, uh, you know, a community and a neighborhood to live in as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, it's just some so something less than that. So uh, we're we're pretty excited and proud about how this is coming together. What about Hello? success stories or data from those other? Like, are they being successful? In yes. Some shape or form? Or yes. So, there are examples, so yeah. Yeah. There are examples on our website of links to other communities who have found success with this project, with these kinds of projects as well. And the factors in their success are much of what the mayor has has mentioned around sort of building a sense of community, strong interaction with the community, with the neighborhood around. So making sure that, you know, the, the folks who are living here are also learning skills about being valuable neighbors and parts of their communities in addition to respecting their space. Um, so there are certainly some best practices um, and different kinds of policies that we've looked at from other communities um, as well. Mayor, you promoted this project in last December as part of your 10-point plan. What do you make of seeing it almost ready to open less than a year later? And how important was having the ARPA funds to kind of nudge it through? <laughs> More than a nudge. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think the ARPA funds were critical. Uh, it would have been very, very difficult to um, move so quickly on a project like this uh, without that kind of support from the from the federal government um, you know similarly we uh, we were able to set up uh, the, the work you know new place really led the way by the city working with them uh, a shelter there in a very short period of time I and mean, we have uh, th this period of federal investment will serve this community well for 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 years years to come um, I, I do think this team has worked really well to make this project move uh, remarkably quickly if you compare it to some of the other projects that we talk about and, and, and focus on at the same time. Um, I think a project like this that is an emergency project that is trying to respond to emergency con uh, conditions should have been even easier to set up. And one other uh, thing that we haven't, I, I believe, gotten done at this point, or it, it's not done, but it's, it's in the works, is a zoning change that would um, make it uh, easier for future emergency shelters to be s permitted and set up so that they don't have to go through the uh, uh, process is really intended for permanent projects that are going to be here uh, in the community um, you know essentially permanently where, where, I, where, where, where are we with that zoning change? I think that zoning change is sitting with the Planning Commission there was um, you know lots of questions and um, not full agreement and the decision was made I think because uh, this project did receive its um, permit and was able to move forward um, to focus on some of the other zoning change initiatives that are going to bring permanent housing um, so I think it's still on the table and, and it's something that we should still be looking at in the city of Burlington um, so it's sort of a, a not totally dormant um, zoning right. change at the Planning Commission level. Thanks for that update. I'm glad we're getting the uh, South End and Trinity Campus first, but we will make sure we come back to that. It, it, it really, this, a project like this shouldn't be subject to the same appeals and uh, delays that, um, uh, that 
um, they, you know, frankly, I don't think the rest of the system should be subject to the same appeals and delays either, but we should start with these emergency facilities. It's probably worth <coughs> noting too that the state of Vermont really supported our effort in terms of the operating funds, so they made a large commitment to cover the cost of staffing the shelters, so that was really pivotal as well. And how does that contract work with CHT? Are you, are you paying them a sum to basically operate this place? Yeah, it'll be a reimbursement contract, so it'll be based on their costs that they incur, but they will be fully covered for that cost. We're not asking Champlain Housing Trust to come in and, and fund that themselves. Yeah. It was approved by the City Council in September, so you can actually find out where that is. Yeah, I want to add to Brian's point. I would say that the, the state has been not only um, a financial partner, but they've been an operational partner. Uh, Jenny Samuelson, the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, has personally been involved in uh, working with us, working with nonprofits to make sure that this facility that, that we were able to come to an agreement uh, for management and uh, helping us uh, find partners for the for the other services as well. So, I uh, we very much appreciate the partnership. We wouldn't be here without um, without the governor's support and without the secretary's personal involvement in uh, getting through some of these challenges. Just briefly on. <clears throat> Back on the kind of the opioid overdoses, which you were yeah. referencing, obviously that's going to be, I think, a concern here. So, in terms of thinking about like the harm reduction strategies that are going to be putting in place here, I guess, is, do you have any sense of what that's going to look like? Like, I know there's going to be staff here, but obviously, you're going to have like training in Narcan, like Narcan available, giving it to residents. Just what sort of harm reduction are you looking yeah, at? Yeah, of course. This? So, we will have Narcan um, available here on site, um, and staff will be trained on how to administer that. Um, I also have recently reached out to, um, I think it's the National Council on, Home Re on um, Harm Reduction to identify some potential trainings um, for staff as well. Um, I think it's important that, that staff is, is comfortable and obviously <coughs> ready and able to um, utilize Narcan um, as needed, um, and it will be handed out without, um, you know, with, without stipulation to people. Um, I also wanted to mention that, um, as I said earlier, Vermont criminal justice reform has a new grant um, that they will be um, utilizing in the community and enrolling members who are interested in um, overdose um, education, um, specifically around testing for fentanyl. Um, and that program will be available to people who are um, guests on site here as well. It's another, just, just real quick, it's another benefit of this location is that we're just a few blocks away from the safe recovery location, the needle exchange, um, where we also, that is one of our uh, nodes in the uh, treatment um, <clears throat> system. And uh, it is, um, I think, another benefit of this location that it should be physically so uh, close to these additional level of ongoing uh, needle and medically assisted treatment services. Just as a follow up to that, um, you mentioned earlier that this place would be staffed for people coming in and out. Will that be, and as well as um, for, for these type of uh, emergencies, would that, would that be a 24 7 type of thing? Because you know these things happen at weird hours in the day and night. We'll be staffing in accordance with the um, zoning regulations, which require two people to be on site for every 35 guests or 25 guests. 25 for guests, 25. 25 guests. 24 guests. Hours, but yes, the, we'll, the site will be staffed 24 yeah. hours a day, seven days a week. more? Okay. If we could um, collect the <laughs> microphones. <laughs>